Hello everybody, welcome to another quarantine vlog with John Grimsmo alone in the shop. I'm kind of liking this, <laughs> but I'm eventually looking forward to everything getting back to normal. So, last night we left the Swiss running for the first time on a new part. Let's go look, I'm super excited. Okay, we'll do one of these. Okay, I see a lot of parts. I see a lot of parts in the parts bin. Let's look. Okay, they all have holes, big holes, that's good. They all have small holes, that's good. I, I stacked up this double barrel thing because it was dripping so much because the oil comes out with the part as well. So like quite a bit of oil came in there, which is good. Let's take a look inside. Oh, I see a huge bird's nest right there. That's not always good. Uh, what's the alarms telling us? Fault tube feeder, so I'm pretty sure we'll be out of bars. Yes, we're out of bars, so that's the alarm. Let's open the door. Just open the door. Bar stock empty. There we go. You gotta clear that error before you can clear this error. There we go. Now I can open the door. No, I gotta turn it on. And then I gotta do a safety check. Then I can open the door. All right, let's see what's going on here. Pretty decent pile of chips down there. I don't like that bird's nest, obviously. Um, look at this one here, holy moly. But the good thing is, my drill bit and my reamer and my lollipop tool are still there. My big drill is still there. Those are the ones that would suck to break. Okay, so I'm gonna check the parts, go through some tolerances. Um, in a perfect scenario, like with this, there's a lot of bounce over, so I don't really know, you know, guaranteed which one's which, but I might redesign this with taller walls or something so that as the part comes out, it can literally only go into the one bin. But the theory is, you know, you set up number one and I know that, for example, these are my first parts that I made and then next, 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 these are the most recent parts. So the theory is almost perfect, um, just needs some evolution and tweaking. But I mean, I got it set to 25. We've got roughly the same amount in every bin. It's pretty awesome. At some uh, shops, especially lathe shops, they're required to check every single part. Um, sometimes we do that, sometimes we don't, depends on the part. Theoretically, if I had a way to check, well, I was checking the parts as I left last night, so I know the first parts were good. And theoretically, if I were able to check the very last part that it made, um, save for any freak deviances, then theoretically, they should all be within that range of last night's part and last part today. Um, the run was, I want to know this, 11 hours, 19 minutes of straight, solid runtime. That's epic. Three bars. Anyway, um, my goal is not to make this another Swiss lathe video. My goal is to move on to another project. I'm just so used to talking about this machine. And I've got a project going right now, so, yeah. Okay. Freaking two tenths, not even. That's where it was when I went home last night. Assuming this is the last part it made, or one of the last. I'm just gonna randomly go through the bin and check a bunch of diameters. I'm checking for consistency across the run and quick check, they're all the same. All the same.
this, this is why you get a Swiss lathe. If you have a lot of parts to make, and this was only, that's something like 200, 250 something parts. That's not a lot for a lot of these shops. A lot of these shops, a uh, buddy of mine, it gets orders for a million parts. That's insane. Not for me. Um, but this is why you get a Swiss lathe. The consistency, so of the probably 20 parts that I measured, I've got a five or six tenths, ten, ten thousandths of an inch. Um, you take an inch, you divide it 10,000 times. That's the measurement unit we're talking about right now. Um, that's a tenth. Range I'm seeing is probably five or six tenths uh, across the batch with a solid, there were a lot right in the middle, right at 3052, 30, um, which is like so good for us. Now, there's more than one tolerance to this part. So I gotta just, I'm pretty confident. I'll check the threads of a bunch of them too. And then if that's good and just visually make sure they're all good, look at the tools, make sure none of them are toast. Then I just have a lot more confidence, a lot more data to, to figure this out. Ooh, so excited, so good. It was kind of risky. Kind of risky running this lathe all night. I gotta tell ya. But that's why I bought it. Okay. Oh, you gotta see this. Uh, how do I hold camera? I move my ladder so I don't have a place to put camera. It will go like this. Um, this chunk is not so bad because these are all fine chips. This chunk is is hard. That's firm, holy mother. That's like steel wool, like, like really firm. Not just stuck on there, I'm talking it's, holy cow. It's dense. Yeah. So what one thing I could do is I could employ a different turning strategy that breaks the chip every time. Um, this machine has active chip breaker, which I use sometimes. Maybe I should be using it for this, which kind of, it takes the tool and it goes bop, 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 instead of just and that creates a shorter chip, not a longer chip. Um, obviously I need to look into that for this code. But otherwise, it's looking good. So for measuring threads, um, there's a couple different ways to do it. The way that we're using right now is we're using a thread wire set, which comes as a kit like this, a bunch of different diameter wires, always in packs of three. So based on uh, standard practices for this thread, which is a uh, 5 32nd, no, 5 16 dash 32, um, I'm using 24 thou wires and I've got them taped together with little green masking tape. And then you want two on the top and one on the bottom. That way the two go in the upper threads and then the one kind of sort of self centers on the bottom. And then you mic the diameter of that. And uh, standard, uh, standard ranges give you a range. So I've got 0.3353 right now. And I wrote down on my little, on my paper towel here. Min is 3341, max is 3371, and that was 335 something. So that is perfectly 3353. So I'm like dead center in the range of acceptable threads. 3355, depending on how you measure it. Um, perfect, dead center. This is for a 3B thread, which is an ultra tight tolerance, like aerospace kind of uh, goodness. So that's how I'm measuring these threads. Um, I could get a thread mic. This is a micrometer. You could get one with little pointy anvils on it that measure the thread. Um, I just haven't yet. It's another $300 tool I don't need to buy right now. And then quick and dirty check is we have a tube, um, like a part of a pen that just got shorter that we threaded both sides on. And uh, somewhere, I think it's by the Nakamura, somewhere we have a plug gauge, which is a male way to measure threads. So this is one, 
it's not for this thread, it's for a different thread, but, um, but yeah, this has a go and a no go. So these two threads, they both look the same, but they're actually slightly different. One's bigger, one's smaller. And uh, the go and no go works awesome. So if the go goes in, you're great. If the no go goes in, the thread is too big. If the go does not go in, then your thread is too small. Uh, until I actually held one in my hand, that didn't fully make sense to me, just because I didn't visualize it um, properly. But then I bought one and now I use them for everything. The point is, the threads on this last part are perfect and the threads on the first part are perfect. Therefore, the run is perfect and the threading tool is still good. Yeah, these are good, these are good. I'm so, so happy right now. I'm gonna turn it on and run more. We're using a little glass jar with simple green cleaning solution in it um, to help break down the oil before they go into the ultrasonic. It's just a good place to put them and let them soak. This is one of the realities of a Swiss lathe with oil. As you always get dripped on, you're up to your elbows literally in oil. I really like, uh, you know, we're a huge fan of the bounty paper towels, the little small size sheets. But for the Swiss stuff and for the lapping as well, we've been using these wipe all from Uline, um, wipe all X70s. They're huge. They're super absorbent. Um, they're they're much tougher than a paper towel, and uh, they absorb a lot. So especially for the Swiss oil and stuff, they're just better. And I'll, I'll reuse it for quite a while until it turns like full yellow. So, pro tip. Oh yeah. That is a good amount of parts. So now what I'm gonna do, that I should have done before, is I got this sweet, sweet, sweet um, digital scale on Amazon. This was like 30 bucks. Proster, uh, Proster digital scale, accuracy 0.01 gram to 500 gram. The cool thing is it has a pieces function, meaning this guy can count how many objects are in there. So pretty simple you turn it on it's got a sweet blue display um, you go to pieces you measure out so if I'm measuring these double thumb studs you measure out 25 and I like to count in fives because I can easily see five five ten you get the point anyway you put 25 in here um, you can also tear out the bin and then you put 25 in and you you tell it there's 25 in here and then you take it off and then it knows that it knows what the bin is because that's tear and then it knows how many pieces you put in there and it's super duper accurate um i don't mind if it's plus or minus one piece but it's it's been perfect every time so that's been an awesome way to measure the quantity of small parts that we use so from whatever i was doing last time this crooked changes but um 100 144 when it's flat and level and then if I put that bin on, 254. That's wrong, but yeah, you get the point. So to add to that, the reason that we measure the quantity of stuff is on this little chart behind me. Um, it's a daily calendar that we made that basically says Monday, Tuesday, you know, the 8th, the 9th, whatever. Um, I write down, okay, on Tuesday I made X many parts. So on Wednesday I made X many parts of this part so that I can look back and I can tell what I've done lately. But then we also put that into a Google spreadsheet that uh, is kind of quantity inventory management. So when we sell an item, it knows that it takes seven screws and two pivots and blah, 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 blah. So that helps us keep track of everything. So check this out real quick. Last part of the day, yesterday, this is the one that was still stuck in the subspindle collet. So I know that all the main spindle side was from yesterday, 3052, just like, uh, just like all the batch. And then the first part today, is 30, 3062, 
depending on how I measure it. So it's a whole one thousandth of an inch bigger. That's enormous. But that's the difference between a hot machine and a cold machine. Um, and it won't take very many parts for the machine to warm up enough to shrink this tool down to the diameter it's supposed to be. I don't have any containers. <laughs> I'm used to making teeny, teeny, tiny little screws and stuff that will fit in the red and green bins. Uh, but these parts are bigger and I'm running out of places to put them. Problem solved. Not for long though, I thought that would last longer than that. 220 parts. Full. So these guys are the springs that we use in the pen. The pen has two springs in it, the tip spring that we get custom made not too far from here, and then a wave spring that's the return spring for the slider right there. So it has to go into there. So that is our wave spring. Just came in 500 pieces, that's good. Should last us a little bit. I don't know if I like the beard, man. I kind of like it, and I mostly hate it. We'll see. I just spent the last uh, good little while unpacking a whole bunch of new material. Got um, 3 8 titanium from Perryman Titanium. This is centerless ground, meaning the outside is like almost perfect. Perfect diameter, really tight tolerance on those tie bars. Quarter inch titanium, same thing. And then 17-4 uh, stainless RD heat treated to H900 from Alexandria Precision. Less, uh, less of a tolerance. The, the stainless is a five, plus or minus 5 tenth range. The titanium is plus or minus 2 tenth range. Um, and yeah, so I'm just unpacking that, getting it on the shelf. Good to go. So the next task I've got to do is just like I did the other day. i got to load up the Mori. I gotta take these uh, blades and handles off and put new ones on. Check this out real quick. So these are our pocket clips as they come off the lapping machine. So this side is not lapped, it's double disc ground. You can see the big swirly long scratches. Some of them are kind of deep. You, you don't see it as, like it's there more than you think it is. And then we lap them this side to get a basically mirror reflective finish. You see all the micro scratching. Um, that's not a big deal because the scratches are so shallow. So this is the face. This will be, you know, the top of the clip. And then the inside doesn't matter as much because it gets all machined away. So we always draw the two lines on the inside so that as we're mounting it on the pallet, we know what side gets cut first. But yeah, I just I was doing this and I thought they were kind of pretty. Then we do the same things for handles, except we wrap them up as regular handles that are perfect on both sides or contour handles that might have a little scratch on one side, um, but those handles will get 3D contoured like these guys. Hey Fraser, I'll probably film this for like a really, really, really long time while I replace both pallets. Just speed it up like as fast as you can. It doesn't need to be long, but you'll have the whole process from further away. Go! I've been doing all kinds of stuff. All kinds. Look at this. Oh. So these are the pandemic knives. Um, check this out. Two examples here. This guy was done using a 10,000 radius engraving tool. And 
this guy was done using a 20 thou radius engraving tool. I was breaking the tip off the 10 thou far too often and annoyingly. So I thought I'd go to the 20 without changing any code or anything. And it's obviously a lot deeper and fatter and I think it's gonna look sick. So what I'm doing right now is engraving the little uh, little message on the inside. So we did it doing a batch of 60, so we're hand engraving every single one. I'm doing 31 next. So I got the paperwork here, just so we can, you know, engrave it, write it down, engrave it, write it down, so we don't forget. Um, Angelo has done 30 so far. I'm gonna do whatever's here today, and then uh, we'll just keep it going, get ourselves to 60. I figured I would do some practice since, uh, well, I haven't hand engraved. I mean, it's, it's kind of important. I haven't done this much. I haven't done it on these yet, so I'm gonna practice one through, uh, one through nine, zero through nine. I would say that's uh, solidly okay. Um, Angelo's tests are a lot better, a lot cleaner. Maybe my tool is chipped or maybe I'm doing it at a, at a different angle than what he is, because mine has burrs in it and I don't like that. Um, so this is a super duper cheap air spindle that uh, it's, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks or something like that. I've had it for a long time, it's, it's okay. When we were at a tool show once, we saw, I think it was electric. And it was like, it was like 100,000 RPM or 300,000 RPM, like something ridiculous. Lighter than this, smaller than this. I think it was NSK. And oh my gosh, it was so beautiful to use. There was no vibration. You just cut and it, no, it doesn't bounce or skip or jump or anything. It was just insane. And it was like four to $800 in that range. Uh, so we definitely put it on our wish list at some point, but, uh, we don't, we do so little hand engraving, but it's awesome. So if you need stuff sometimes, like the good stuff's really good. But for now, this will work fine. You can tell when you've been inside for quite a while and loud machines, so you can't hear what's going on outside. You can even see. It's like, it's really raining. All right, boys and girls, that wraps up this video. I'm home. I wanted to film a bit more at the shop, but for some reason I didn't leave till like midnight. It was already midnight. And now it's like 1.30 and I needed to film my outro. So here's the outro. Anyway, I might take a couple days off. I've been working a lot at the shop. Um, it be nice to spend some time with the family here. So I might get some stuff done and try to vlog it, or I might skip a couple days. I don't know yet. But anyway, it's been fun. See you soon. Bye.